Fluid Flow, Simple and Complex. Thank you to Juan Carlos, and I recommend this book by Macquarie, but there are many other books. Fluid Mechanics is one of the most applicable topics in physics. There's a Millennium Prize problem if you solve these equations rigorously. Navier-Stokes equations are the non-relativistic fluid equations that have viscosity and terms on the right-hand side. I will approximate the viscosity to zero and get the order of fluid equations. If you also assume that the velocity field u that we're solving for has no rotation and is incompressible, we get what's called potential theory, where we solve Laplace's equation, not terribly realistic. Feynman calls it the flow of dry water. Dry meaning not realistic. But that's basically what I'll be talking about here in two dimensions. Take a look in Macquarie chapter 19 or Fitzpatrick's book. We assume no rotation. That means by Stokes' theorem there exists a potential of which the velocity field vx and vy in two dimensions is the gradient in this sense. Also assume for simplicity incompressible fluid. The divergence is zero, so this combination is zero. If you combine these two statements, then as I said on the previous slide, this results. This is the Laplace equation in two dimensions in Cartesian coordinates x and y. Now this will be very simple fluids, but we can describe them using complex variables. So form a function that Macquarie calls capital omega, which is the combination of this velocity potential with an imaginary part called the stream function. If omega of z is an analytic in z, meaning it doesn't have any z bar, then it can show that the stream function, the imaginary part of this complex capital omega, also satisfies the Laplace equation. At first, this seems completely useless. We just have another copy of the same equation that we wanted to solve. But this really helps geometrically, because the curves of constant real part of an analytic function are orthogonal to the curves of the imaginary part of the analytic function. So there's a nice exercise in very basic complex analysis to show that these are orthogonal. You can get a feeling from the idea that multiplication by i rotates a complex number by 90 degrees. For example, i times 1 rotates it up to i. More physically, here's an example. If you set omega of z to a constant v0 times z, so just a linear complex function, then this has these real and imaginary parts. So we immediately read off that the velocity field, vx, vy, only has an x component because the gradient of this is 0 in the y direction and v0 in the x direction. Remember this is a potential, this is not the velocity. The velocity is the gradient of the potential. The streamlines are horizontal. Just divide this constant down, you see that y is constant. So curves y equal constant are horizontal straight lines. The uniform flow goes along these straight streamlines in this example. But of course this is the boring example viewed as a solution of differential equation. A linear function solves the Laplace equation trivially. So can we get something more interesting? We should use all the nice features of complex numbers like the conformal map. So a conformal map is that any complex analytic function is a sort of map that preserves angles. In the z-plane we have real part x and y, and in the w-plane we call the real parts u and v. Now why is this useful here? Certainly a general map of your coordinates doesn't always give a solution from a solution in the original variables. But it does here. The fast way to see is to say that you can write the Laplacian in complex coordinates as partial z, partial z bar, and any analog function is annihilated by delta z bar, so at least it looks like you will still solve the Laplace equation after the map. And this fast argument is mostly true. If we solve the Laplace equation in z, it is solved at w, except there could be problems at special points. It's not so obvious from this argument here, but it's explained in the quarry, and I encourage you to do this calculation. Set a transformed field, capital Phi, of u and v as phi of x and y. We plug in this map that maps x and y to u and v. And then they show this transformation property. So if this is equal to 0, it only applies that this is equal to 0, provided nothing funny happens here. In general, I encourage you to work with the real variables and the real functions until you get used to them, and then you work with the complex functions. If you heard of conformal maps, you've probably seen examples like these. The square root map will sort of twist a nice smooth grid like this into this twisted grid, and the same with the third root map, it also twists it but even more, so to speak. I will typically give a code in Mathematica. I don't at all say that you need to do this in Mathematica, but it's important to get your hands dirty and do something in detail. And on that note, let me talk about implicit versus explicit. Both are useful. So let's take a circle. If you contour plot this circle, you get a beautiful circle like this. 
If you think about it, your software here, Mathematica, they divide this coordinate square into tiny points, and each point it looks for a solution of this equation within some accuracy. But an infinitely thin circle, you couldn't even see. And in fact, it's even adaptive that it notices that it needs more points. It can add more points close to the actual circle, so it looks nice and smooth like this. But this is like buying canned soup. Canned soup is great, but it's not good for everything. So to paraphrase Feynman, different representations of the same thing can be useful in different ways. So let's do the more explicit thing where we solve this equation. You'll immediately notice that this breaks the symmetry that we had here between x and y, but the obvious choice that most people pick without thinking is solve for y. Because then we get two functions, y of x, and we can plot both of them, one blue and one black, and we get the circle back. So each method has an advantage and a disadvantage. You could do both of them yourself on paper. Many of us are more comfortable with this method. To mathematicians, this method is equally important. Now the circle is very special, it has lots of symmetry, it's only a quadratic equation. What happens if you go to higher order than 2 in this implicit versus explicit question? And before I go on, this is important when we solve the Laplace equation in the z or the w coordinate in the conformal map, because the streamline here in the z plane will map to some streamline in the w plane. And an example of that is this quartic equation. So the figure 8 is a familiar figure in itself, and one implementation of it is this equation. To solve it, it, as expected, has four solutions, but something happens now that doesn't have an obvious analogy in the circle case. These four solutions partially cover each other. So you have these four functions y of x, but it looks like you only need two of them, blue and black, and the other ones, let's say, are red and green. So here's an exercise for yourself. You don't need mathematics if you don't want. So try to figure out for yourself which solutions are plotted here in the sense which solutions cover another solution. We let it sweep out this curve. Now the conformal map I want to use for fluids is this map. This is transcribed in many different ways, sometimes with a Z, sometimes with an I. I'm not going to venture to say what the correct pronunciation is. Let's call it the J map. It looks like this. If you write out the real imaginary parts, this is how Mathematica does it. You can certainly do it yourself by hand. You get this real part and this imaginary part. So it's a reasonably simple looking map in polar coordinates. Here's what it looks like in Cartesian coordinates. How does that help us with fluids? If we interpret the complex function omega of z as this j of z, meaning this function, we can use our implicit method, contour plot this, which means Mathematica will itself pick a bunch of contours, or you can yourself set it equal to some constant value and interpret this without solving for y now as a curve in the xy plane. And those are the streamlines. In fluid mechanics, this is interpreted as the flow around a circular obstacle in two dimensions. Now, what's going on inside here, just like in my video when we solved the Laplace equation in electrostatics is at first sight not important. So for the purposes now you can just blank out this circular region. It is significant that there are some singularity-like things here that are introduced by the transformation and in fact this is to be expected. We see that definitely something funny happens at least at zero but maybe at other points. So that was the implicit solution. Let's look at explicit solution. Let's set this imaginary part, the stream function, equal to some given constant j value. And if you solve it, for example, for j value 1, you get three solutions. Try to do this yourself and convince yourself you get three solutions for y. And here's one. I'm going to take one moment and advocate for those of you who are skeptical. Any of this kind of stuff helps to do real fluid mechanics, because of course that's just huge simulations. I would advocate that there's a middle ground between simple models compute by hand and huge computer simulations. And I think that provided by symbolic manipulation programs like Mathematica or Maple or Sage or something like that. What I mean by that here is that you can maybe manipulate the circle solutions by hand, but as soon as you get to these kind of expressions, and maybe one that's a page long, it becomes hard to do it by hand, but it's still quite simple to do it in a symbolic manipulation program. So if you just plot this now for different values of j, you get these streamlines we had before. Typically here you have to play around a little bit to get decent plots. We start getting our hands dirty to get a feeling for this flow. So since you made it this far, I will reward you, or rather Juan Carlos will reward you, with these beautiful applets of fluid mechanics. So this round obstacle here can by conformal maps be distorted into something that can be used in, for example, aerodynamics. So this now looks like a little bit like an airplane wing. If you go to table of contents, you can immediately enjoy the Riemann surfaces. I have a video about that, but this is very clear and basic. I strongly recommend taking a look here at the square root function, for example. 
But what we want to do here is more to go to chapter 6, Applications and Conformal Mappings. He has slightly different notation, what I call capital omega, he calls f, but the velocity potential is called phi in both cases. Now this example is like the linear flow I had, but with a complex phase in front of it. Let's see what this does. You go down and you click here. You see that the flow goes at an angle. We can get our flow back by taking this angle to zero. Now we have this horizontal flow that I talked about. You can click on trace to see these streamlines form as these particles move. I'm sure you're immediately curious, as am I, how does Juan Carlos make these beautiful plots? The great thing is he gives you all the codes. You can yourself go and deconstruct it. It's all available on GitHub. Now here's a complex potential that I would call omega of z that I didn't consider, a constant times a logarithm. This is a source or a sink. It looks like this. Here's a source due to a negative number. It's a sink. And it's literally you see everything falls into the sink or things come out of the source. So the great thing with solving linear differential equations is they can combine these different solutions into a more complicated solution. So this is this linear potential combined with the source. Looks like this. There's a source at zero, stuff is coming out. We can increase more of the source. And the flow speed, we can change like this. Or we can look at the particles instead, which is instructive in its own way. Now we go straight to this map that we talked about. So the map squashes the unix circle down to the real line segment. And circles are mapped to ellipses. Here's an applet that shows that circles are mapped to ellipses. But that goes for circles like this. What happens if I move the circle a little bit like this? McQuarrie suggests to go to a fifth and a fifth. So something like that. And then you apply the map. Then it starts going. You kind of see where it's heading. It looks more like that airplane wing type thing. And as soon as you hit the singularity where it really becomes very sharp cusp here. But if you keep going, you go past it, and now you look more like a figure eight. You start seeing where these questions we had earlier about solving polynomial equations comes into this stuff when we're doing these conformal maps. More explicitly, he considers this flow now, where you also have this extra circulation term. So when there's an I here, this is called a vortex. So it's very similar to the source of sync, except the circles around the point z equals zero. We saw we didn't want a circle centered at zero. So this map takes a unit circle and shifts it and rescales it. And here's what you get. First the circle. And then we turn on this map. So here's the airfoil. We turn on the streamlines, and you see that it goes beautifully around. It goes sort of slower here, mm, it's slow. And then here, interestingly, it goes kind of straight here, but it dips down a little bit here before it goes up again. You also see that in the particle thing, they sort of start getting a little bit stuck there, but then they move on. Of course, we shouldn't get too excited. This is, again, very simplified. It's not at all clear that a real airplane wing works like this. In particular, this is two dimensions, so this wing is also infinitely long in the transverse direction into and out of the screen. But at least I think this is pretty impressive for simple enough math. Now, when you enjoy Juan Carlos's beautiful apps, you might feel some reluctance to come back to me here and look at these explicit things in symbolic manipulation program. I think it's a great thing if you went to GitHub and try to understand how those applets are really made, but I think it's complementary to try to solve things both by hand, of course, and since you get slightly complicated equations using a symbolic manipulation program where, however, everything is explicit. Here's a shifted circle, as we saw in the applet, but here in Macquarie's convention, where this is the circle, is shifted by a fifth exactly up here, and the radius is this. Macquarie puts a one half here. We're going to solve this so we get the inverse transformation, meaning expressing x and y in the w real and imaginary parts u and v. And if I do that, I plug in these inverse transformations into this equation, get the curve in the UV plane that this is mapped to. Now you might say this is not very pretty, but again, it's not too long and it's certainly something that Mathematica can handle. 
but if you try to plot it using contour plot, you get something that is this airfoil. So the key point is that the circle is mapped to the airfoil. I say it again, we have this shifted circle, you apply the transformation, this transformation, z plus 1 over z, you get this fun curve here with this cusp. Now if you look carefully, you see some ugly little dots here, and there's something missing here. And why was the different color here? Well, the different color is just like we had before with the figure 8 here. We had a different color because different solutions cover different ranges. And the little dots here in the missing part has to do with the contour plot. So you can always fiddle with it, you can make it to a finer grid, you can make it better certainly. I kept it here to illustrate that Mathematica is doing a lot of hard work for you in this canned approach. So to get the streamlines, I would like you to do it explicitly. Transform the streamlines we had to the UV plane. And I claim you get something like this. So this is how you get your hands dirty. You take our explicit solutions. Remember, they look something like this. Not too bad. And they apply a map like this. And you get these curves that you could see. For example, this feature that the streamlines first go kind of smooth there. But if you get close, you kind of bend down a little bit before you come back up. And by the way, how fast it goes, you can't really see in this kind of plot of the streamline. This is kind of a static plot. So it's useful as a complement to really do vector plot where you see the different lengths of the velocity vector at different positions. Or even better, this beautiful atlas that we just saw. Now I should admit, none of this is particularly elegant. I can't really say this is a beautiful equation, but I claim that if you mainly jump to solving complex equations, I find students get confused. So in my experience, try to work with the real transformations, use real variables x, y, and u, and v, and then do these maps explicitly. And then you can appreciate when you solve the complex equations, which is very natural. After all, we were doing complex maps, so it's natural to do complex contour plot. Now here's a little bit of code. You can come back here and pause it, but I encourage you to try yourself in whatever piece of software you're using, or of course you can do it all by hand. To summarize, what we did was solve the Laplace equation in two dimensions to get the most basic, simple fluid flows using complex equations.